Dr. Hannah Short is a GP specialist in menopause, POI and premenstrual disorders. Hannah has a particular interest in induced menopause, premature ovarian insufficiency, POI and hormone sensitivity disorders. She is a member of the IAPMD Clinical Advisory Board and the Surgical Menopause Advisory Committee and has previously worked as a volunteer doctor for the DAISY Network, a charity dedicated to girls and women diagnosed with POI. Hannah has personal experience of premature surgical menopause, having undergone a hysterectomy and ovary removal at the age of 35. This drives her passion and informs her work. And Dr. Mandy Leonhardt is a general practitioner and a menopause specialist based in Hampshire in the UK. She is a certified nutritionist and a certified International Society for Gynecological Endocrinology practitioner. Mandy has a particular interest in women's hormonal health, lifestyle, medicine and nutrition. With a colleague, she organised and hosted England's first menopause cafe back in 2018 a pop-up event for women to share their menopause experiences. Together, Dr. Hannah Short and Dr. Mandy Leonhard have co-authored and published the brilliant book, this one, The Complete Guide to POI and Early Menopause. Oh, welcome. Welcome, Mandy. Welcome, Hannah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, so first of all, congratulations on your uh, brilliant book, The Complete Guide to POI and Early Menopause. Um, I just want to say in your author's notes at the beginning, you state that your aim is to inform and empower the reader and you hope there is something in the book for everyone. Well, we would like to say that you've definitely achieved that aim. Um, we, just each chapter could be a, a mm. book in itself couldn't yeah. it? it absolute absolute marvel um so we we like to briefly go through um if we've got time and um, the main <laughs> themes of the book but um if we may before we do um in your introduction you tell us why early menopause matters just last week, we had the APPG put forward recommendations for a menopause health check at 45 years old. Now, a lot of folks I've been seeing on social media have been saying that's sort of too old. Um, obviously, we think it's better than nothing. But what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Would you like to see something like that, but at a much younger age or... Yes, I, th I, th I think it's um, I think it's com it's complicated. I think it's, any awareness raising is great, but we have I mean we have to think about it in the context of how the NHS is at the moment, and uh, we can't really have unrealistic expectations. I think what we need to probably do is is raise awareness on the back of something that's already happening within the NHS. So we, I mean, yes, in an ideal world, we'd say every, every year maybe we'd have a, a you know, woman would have a review with a, a doctor who's got knowledge in women's health and go through some screening questions. In reality, that's not going to happen. Um, I mean, maybe one idea was it, it's a, a smear, you know, or, or, or you know, cervical screening, um, giving out information leaflets and and um, or asking a couple of questions, and that and that could happen from you know any or from 25 onwards you know yeah. um just just to be aware of changes and when you should speak to your doctor um realistically I mean I don't know Mandy might have a different view I don't see how we're gonna implicate this and you know you know bring these into the um into the NHS the way things are at the moment yeah. so in some ways it's kind of irrelevant I mean it's an important discussion I just genuinely don't know how practically it's going to happen mm, so yeah. I think we need to piggyback on the back of something that's already there yeah I agree. Yeah, I, I have to say I agree with Hannah. It's 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 a start. It's a it's um it's it's sort of um they show their willingness to have a more structured approach to supporting women through menopause, but to just have um a random pick a random age, age forty five, and then you will inevitably see some women who are already in the in the midst of their menopause journey with full blown symptoms, and then you'll also meet some women who may not have symptoms yet. Or yeah. First case, you see a woman who is in early menopause, and you missed you missed her. You know, you you did not see her when she was thirty nine, when she should have been seen because she wasn't aware of, of this, or it, it she didn't reach get the help. Mm. And as that um, in other countries in Europe, uh, women would see their gynecologist um, um, as an as an outpatient um, once a year for uh, a general gynae checkup, 
um, or possibly, and I mean, that is the case in Germany where I'm from, you don't need to have annual smears, for example, I don't agree with that. And, and they, I think they are not no longer doing this, but what it means is from the age of, um, uh, of, of, of adulthood, from the age of 18, girls would start seeing a gynecologist. And I had my own gynecologist from that age. And um, that was an opportunity to discuss about anything, you know, from perception to bleeding issues to pain issues with period related problems. So, um, and this is this is something that is obviously a great luxury that uh, women in Europe may have access to. In the UK, we don't have that. So just picking a random age during which we have the opportunity maybe for five minute conversation about mm. menopause, it's better than nothing. But as Hannah mm. said, I, I think it's um, we need to to reach out for women earlier. And um, obviously, Diane Dane Spring has done that by incorporating uh, menopause on the curriculum. So girls need to be informed uh, during the educational years. And then we also need to reach out to younger women um, so that they are prepared. Um, 45 is probably, I know why they chose that age, uh, because um, it's it's when natural menopause is sort of um, acceptably happening. Mm. But um, a lot of women I know have symptoms way earlier than that. Mm. Yeah, we're all so different, aren't yeah. we? And yeah. I, yeah, we agree. I think piggybacking on something that's there, the smear test just seems such a simple, easy mm. idea. Even if it's just a leaflet, mm. it would begin, yeah. you know, it would be, we would have had a, a, some idea of what when even oh, crikey, we were yeah. natural menopause, but it would have given us some idea what we were heading heading to, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. Yeah, no, I like, I like that idea very much. And it would actually then inform, you know, your healthcare practitioners as well, because they would have to be learning yeah. some more, wouldn't they? Yeah, and break the stigma and the taboo if, it, if it's just out there, you know, and people, more people are talking yeah. about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, in the first and the second chapters, the lowdown on early menopause and the deep dive, you look at what is going on, symptoms, cause, causes and impact. So what is going on in POI and early menopause? And are the menopause symptoms and treatments the same as in the later natural menopause. Mm. Oh. There we go. Okay. Where, do, where do we begin first? with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big, well, for, it, yes, it is a big it question. Is a big so question. I suppose, for, yeah, first of all, what what is, for anyone that doesn't know, what, what is the difference maybe between POI mm -hmm. and early menopause? Um, well, POI stands for premature ovarian insufficiency, and it's the now it's now preferred term for premature menopause. But it also it's a little bit of more of a broader term because menopause and POI aren't exactly one and the same, but they are used interchangeably. Um, essentially, premature ovarian insufficiency it means when there's a loss of, of normal ovarian function and then a, a loss of normal production of ovarian hormones, so estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and below the age of forty. And that can mean that periods have stopped completely, or it can mean that there's, you know, a fluctuating ovarian activity. Um, but to be honest, the reason that the, the terms are used kind of interchangeably sometimes is, is because the, the groups of women who are affected by, you know, POI, where there may be more of a fluctuating ovarian, you know, kind of picture. Um, and actually when periods have actually stopped, which is, you know, a sign of menopause, is that there's low levels of estrogen overall, and that's what's affecting these women. Um, and whether that's through symptoms or long term health. But with POI, there's obviously often other concerns about things like fertility and uh, the her psychological impact is huge as well. Um, the, it's it's just a huge topic. And I think there has been a lot of debate about what we should call the reduction in ovarian hormones if it happens below the age of 40. And POI now is the preferred term, but it probably doesn't sum it up for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, early menopause um, occurs between the age of 40 and 45. And there are a group of women who probably have missed out a lot of the conversations because they don't fall into the POI group. They don't fall into the natural menopause group. Um, but again, the reason we brought them together in the book is because there are a group of, of younger women who have been been affected by the loss of their ovarian hormones whether it's a complete stopping of their periods or they're only having in, you know fl a fluctuating picture but they're, they're, they're still long-term health impacts and um, impacts on their fertility and their general well-being mm -hmm. and and so Mandy what what would um that would the symptoms we'd be looking at with POI would they be much the same at, at any age they, they can be very similar, um, like those that women would typically experience um, at a natural age of menopause, around from starting 45 onwards. But it very much also depends on when um, 
when the girl or woman is diagnosed. So PUI goes as far back as, as, as puberty. So really even from age 11, if their ovaries aren't working properly, they won't have estrogen. But the difference here is that they don't know any different. So mm -hmm. they're estrogen or not a lot, or they've never had a normal puberty if it's not been picked up or diagnosed properly. So they may have symptoms, but they may not be as severe or they may just feel perpetually tired. Um, they may have brain fog. They may feel slowed down or can't keep up. They may have physical symptoms too, like hot flashes and night sweats, but generally it could just be a severe lack of fatigue or recurrent infections. Um, and for them, it, because they have never known any different, it is very difficult for them sometimes for, for, for girls who are affected by this to tell the difference what, what it is because the symptoms are not um, necessarily new it's what they have been experiencing throughout their puberty for example they may start to feel better when they start taking treatments or HIT for example so that's when they actually know what it's like to have energy or sleep through the night properly or um, have normal development um, with regard to their breast development and everything else but let's say if you have um, a woman who is 25 and has up till then had normal periods, fairly regular periods, so she knows what a regular menstrual cycle is like and what it feels like, and then her cycle becomes very infrequent or even stops, then yes, the symptoms can be quite severe because you, we have to remember that women in that age group are used to having actually quite uh, high levels of, of hormones sometimes, you know, they fluctuate across the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm entirely normal but for example testosterone peaks at age 25 which is, gives us energy and sex drive and libido and um and makes us feel confident uh, you know in the best of cases so if we no longer make these hormones because we no longer ovulate or our ovaries are no longer contributing a great deal of testosterone or stop making estrogen or just function at the very low level the symptoms can be quite abrupt quite severe um and so this is this is very devastating, very debilitating. Overall, the breadth of the symptoms is very much the same as, as women experience when they're older. It's very much the same, but it is extremely individual. So we cannot say, oh, these women only get those symptoms. They can get the whole width mm. of menopausal symptoms that we that we know of, you know, starting from, from brain psychological um, functioning, brain health, cognitive health, physical health, muscles, vaginal health, genital urinary health. All of this can be affected, energy levels. Um, so yes, it's really complex and, and we need to see women individually um, um, with regards to what treatment is concerned, but also what symptoms um, are concerned. There may even be some who, who find um, they don't have many symptoms. You know, they, they, it, it, they may not be very much aware of it. And that is actually the group where we are more, most concerned about because they may not necessarily think it is, uh, is it a severe condition, which it is. Mm. Yeah, especially yeah. if they haven't started their periods, I mean, um, or they just have, yeah. a, you know, a, a couple of periods and, and that, that might be their only exactly. kind of sign, really. But um, yeah. yeah, but and as Mandy said, if they've not been primed to be experiencing the, the irregular menstrual cycle, they're just not aware. So yeah, that we spoke to Natasha, didn't we? Natasha, who, uh, Rowens, Natasha yeah. Rowens, mm -hmm. who went into menopause at 13 and yes because she was very unaware and of course stigma at that age um and it was a vaginal atrophy I think sort of having left that for 11 years before she actually sought treatment you know it's it's now in in latter years sort of in her late 40s that it's it's really causing a, a problem so I suppose it's very difficult isn't it mm. and and surgical menopause you're saying there that you know women I suppose um if you're in natural menopause it fluctuates doesn't it but re really it's kind of just dwindling a little bit mm. but surgical menopause particularly for you for you Hannah um you must just suddenly yeah I suppose that's it just it it yeah. just stops yeah and I think um this is important I think for people to realize that surgical menopause is very different from natural menopause and also from um a spontaneous POI so there's a number of reasons that women can develop POI um which you know, so we go into detail in the book, but there's genetic causes, there's autoimmune causes, there's it can be association with certain infections, particularly in the developing world. Um, although most of the time we don't know what causes it. In women who have their ovaries removed, we obviously know what puts them into a premature menopause, or sometimes this is called surgical POI. 
Um, and yes, you go from, in most cases, a normal decent level of premenopausal estrogen um, to postmenopausal levels overnight. And so the symptoms can be dramatic and sudden and quite severe. And it's a chronic condition. It doesn't get better. I mean, it does get better in terms of your body adapts to some extent. But you know, people talk about with natural menopause coming through the other side, when do things settle down? That's not going to happen with surgical menopause because you're always going to be in a surgical menopause state. So um, or they say, although your body can adapt, you're always going to be deficient. Um, and I think this is an appropriate term to use with surgical menopause because you have had part of your endocrine system removed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I didn't expect um, the symptoms I got because I, I naively assumed, okay, I'll have surgery, I'll have some ad back HRT and I'll just get on my way. And I, I was naive, even though I was a doctor and I'd looked into this and I had good gynae care and everything like that. I, I still was slightly taken aback at how dramatically it hit me. So, mm. yeah, mm. yeah, it's, it's, and that, but the going back to your, your book though, and you talking about um, the causes that you put in there, I, that was, it was fascinating yeah, um, it was. because quite, quite often, you know, obviously, as you say, mo a lot of the times you don't know the causes um, unless it's surgical of, of POI. Um, but there was all sorts of um, like, I think Turner syndrome was, was one of them. There's, there's a few different, um, which it's, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask you about causes so that, so really, for, would you say there's a high percentage of people with POI that there's just no, you're never going to find out, you're never going to know for sure? Probably the majority. So we have wow. a chance of finding a cause if it happens in puberty, because they have a more thorough workup. So if you do not um, have a normal puberty, um, pubertal development with, uh, you know, having your, starting your period, having secondary development, a sexual development with, with your breast, breast growth and height growth and, um, um, and your period never starts, for example, it starts and then never happens again. They are often seen in a multidisciplinary team, hopefully, and hopefully then they have um, all the workup, which includes a pelvic scan, blood testing, possibly also genetic testing. And often, or I wouldn't say often, but, but we, we often can exclude at least uh, a number of, of reasons, including um, genetic reasons, or we can confirm that there is a genetic reason. In women who had previously had um, a normal puberty and had periods, and then um, it happens to them at a later age, so let's say between 20 and 30 or 20 and 40, often we don't, um, it's much harder to get the whole uh, spectrum of diagnostics done. So we often do not do uh, genetic testing or um, other tests. And often the reasons may, may well be different. It may be to do with autoimmune conditions. And again, we cannot always blame a specific autoimmune uh, condition, but we do know that 40% of women with POI have immune conditions alongside their POI. So that doesn't mean that the immune condition caused the POI, it just means we happen to observe that they have they coexist alongside each other and there seems to be an overlap or a higher risk of if you have an autoimmune condition that you have a higher risk of POI mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so sometimes we do not know what, um, or in, I would say, in the going back to your question, in the majority of cases in women who are um, between 20 and 40, we probably do not, do not know what the exact cause was. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the, the if there is an underlying cause we could treat, which is very rare actually, um, that would be great, but the treatment would still be HRT. Um, so even if you have an autoimmune condition uh, that you could manage, we would not just ignore the POI and hope for the best, we still have to address the POI. Um, and um, we cannot, there is often no, no cure for autoimmune conditions either. There's certainly no cure for mm -hmm conditions so whilst it is often frustrating for women not to know why it happens to them what exactly caused this it doesn't often make a huge difference to the treatment no no it's as you say it's just the frustration isn't it yes it, we, we're creatures that want to know we want, we want to have the answers yeah, don't we, we do we do yeah. we, we want to know yeah so you've you've given um a chat to each to um hormone treatment and to non-hormonal treatment and we have some frequently asked questions about hrt which we thought might be good to look at okay so you're ready so a do i have to take hrt i am worried about the risks 
and would prefer to manage my symptoms naturally. So would you, you know, do you, do you have to take HRT? Um, we would strongly recommend it. Um, and I think all the, all the guidelines um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, trials would suggest it's really very important. Obviously, there are some important exceptions. So women who are being treated for hormone dependent cancer, and that's, a, a you know, a, their special cases. Um, but the vast majority of women should be prescribed HRT, whether or not they actually have any symptoms. And I think that can be the hardest group to kind of reach because particularly in the, because there's been more awareness raised of menopause generally. I mean, that's a great thing. Um, but then there's also, there are lots of debates on both sides, aren't there? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the risks of HRT are overinflated in the women taking it for natural menopause. Um, but the risks for, for POI, um, and when we're talking about things like breast cancer risk and things like that, they, they're pretty non-existent because women with POI actually automatically have a lower risk of developing breast cancer anyway. And you're just, we're just giving them HRT to top up their levels back to where they should be if they were naturally premenopausal women. So we have to, we have to look at each case individually, but, but the, the risks that you hear don't apply to women. Um, if, you know, we're replacing these hormones because there is a true hormone deficiency in POI or premature menopause. Um, they need the estrogen for their heart, for their bones, for their brain, and for general health and well-being. Um, and it, yeah, and there, there's things that we can do that can minimize the risks of particular treatments. So if you take oral HRT in a tablet, there is always a small increased risk of um, a blood clot, um, but it's far less than being on the combined pill, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in most women, we would we probably give a transdermal HRT because you could then get rid of that risk completely. Um, but the, the small risk of, of a to, you know, increased risk of blood clot is far lower than the risk of heart disease, um, osteoporosis, dementia, Parkinsonism that come with untreated POI. Um, so yes, we would certainly encourage it and, and recommend it. Um, okay. And yeah, I, I think I think that's the bottom line, isn't it, really, Mandy? Yeah. But absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So an another question um, was that um, I was diagnosed with POI twenty years ago, but was never offered HRT. Is it too late? Um, that's a really good question, and I have actually come across women who, who had this experience, um, who were not diagnosed or were, who, who were just not aware that it's not normal not to have a period mm. long, or maybe they didn't have severe symptoms at the time. It, it, in, in theory, so let's say if they're under 50, um, then I would have a very low threshold of, of still putting them on HRT, because they, they also, if I meet a woman like that, I, she needs quite a few tests to check for any repercussions as a result of not having having been in, in early menopause for so long. So I would um, request a DEXA scan for her bone mineral density scanner to check has she got osteoporosis already. I would do um, I would probably send her to a cardiologist to check for um, cardiovascular disease. Um, obviously, she needs a blood pressure check. Um, I would also look at her muscle strength and and see if she's got any muscle wasting, which again can be a risk of not having estrogen. Um, for example, so if she does have any, um, any uh, conditions that are related to lack of estrogen, for example, if she has got osteoporosis, that would for me be a very, very um, strong indication to slowly reintroduce estrogen again. Now, we have to remember that if she hasn't had estrogen for 20 years, we have to mm. be with introducing it because it could be a shock to the system not not in a sense that it's dangerous but it should, her body has very well adapted to not having it so we have to my motto would be to go slow and slow with introducing it and and then reach hopefully a level that she can tolerate where she actually feels the benefits too um so maybe has more energy maybe her brain functions better um so I would definitely, if, if she's, let's say if she's 60 um, and has absolutely no menopausal symptoms, has no osteoporosis, then it's more of a discussion of whether what will, what are your benefits? What, what are we trying to achieve with the age? Mm. So it yeah. very much depends on which age does she come to see me? Um, has she got underlying conditions that the HRT would benefit, where she would get major benefits from? from taking HRT, one of them would be osteoporosis, for example. So this is a very individual uh, question that needs to be looked at in, in the individual context um, of, of the woman. But on the whole, I would say it isn't too late. <laughs> missed out 20 years. You can always uh, look at the, the benefits and hopefully when you work with a woman, uh, reintroduce it slowly. 
but um, equally it is her decision not to take it then. But I would then also look very strongly at lifestyle. I would look at her exercise regime. I would look at her, her alcohol and smoking um, and, and would strongly encourage her to, to have a really healthy lifestyle as, as well as she can to prevent any further problems in the future. Okay. And the last one of this, this little group of questions I got here is, I use the same dose of HRT every day, but still, still feel that my hormone levels fluctuate. So why? Why does that happen? Oh, we see this, I think, really commonly, don't we, Mandy? And, that, and I think this happens mm -hmm. in natural menopause as, as well. There's so many things that can, you know, affect HRT metabolism. So, you know, how well your body utilizes it. Um, if you if, if a woman still has her ovaries, whether this is in POI or natural menopause, then there's, there can still be fluctuating ovarian activity. So occasionally the ovaries will produce small amounts of, um, you, you know, their, their own estrogen. And if they ovulate again, progesterone, this wouldn't happen in natural menopause, but can occasionally happen in POI. So there can be this wide variation um, that, that goes on. Um, it's also... Uh, it can be things like stress can affect how your body utilizes HRT. Um, I mean, I've seen this numerous times when somebody's undergone a massive life event, maybe they've lost a close relative, or they've gone through a divorce or a breakup, or they've, you know, some massive thing at work or, a, a, you know, a university exams, things like that. So the big outpouring of stress hormones can affect how well your body can take or use the HRT. Um, we know that cortisol and the stress hormone seems to block the actions of HRT or estrogen whether it's from your own body or, or from HRT. And that's why working on stress management is really important. And it's not always within our control, of course. Um, things like, you know, Mandy's already alluded to it, but, you know, diet and lifestyle can, can affect fluctuations in, in, in your hormone levels, depending on the gut bacteria, which, which um, there's something called the estrobolone. So a group of bacteria in the gut that actually metabolize the estrogens um, and it affects how much you can reabsorb from your gut when it should actually be passed through your gut and vice versa. So that can, that can lead to that as well. Other medications can affect it. Um, so there, there's a whole host of things again if you um if you change the temperature so if you suddenly go abroad somewhere and it's 35 degrees the absorption of hrt if you take it through the skin will will be exacerbated you know it'll be it'll, it'll escalate um you might burn through your estrogen far more quickly so there's a whole host of things that that can af affect your hormone levels and if you're somebody without ovaries like me and like a number of patients i see you don't have, um, I was called like the ovarian buffer. If you don't have ovaries, if you get, if you are physically unwell, so you have the flu or you have COVID, um, your your body's needs for estrogen will go up, but but you can't produce anymore because you don't have your ovaries. And if you're not, you know, changing your HRT, and that that's quite hard to do. It's not as black and white saying, oh, if you're ill, just slap on some more estrogen. It's not quite that simple. But there's things like that. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's stress and illness can increase your body's need for this. And if you're in surgical menopause, then you're already at a deficit. Um, yeah. So there's, million, there's a host of things that can affect mm. it. You know, I learned so much in what you just said. There. Yeah, me too. Sometimes I've been yeah, writing notes. Absolutely. There's so many variables, isn't yeah. there? So many variables, because that's one thing a lot of the women we speak speak to at the cafes and things uh, say exactly the same, you know, but, and they also sort of say that, oh, I tried um, HRT um, for three months, but it, it didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't work. Or it, or it did this or it did that. Um, and, and again, it takes a little while, doesn't it? And I, I imagine that's the same, whether in natural menopause, POI also, Mm. menopause as you say with some people you've got to introduce it sort of very slowly uh, but it takes a, a while doesn't it to to sort of um settle in sorry she's playing footsie with me because i've just dropped the book on the floor i'm just gonna go and get the book <laughs> no no it, it, it definitely it definitely does and i think it's i mean i always say this and i know mandy will do the same that it takes a while when you start hrt to kind of find balance but even though there will always be daily fluctuations i mean even women who are not in menopause <laughs> obviously have fluctuations in how they feel yeah. and often related to their hormones i mean there's a whole other topic of premenstrual disorders but not even as necessarily the disordered level just general changes in how we feel because of fluctuations because our our body is is a changing thing it's nothing is static um, um yeah. and, it, it, even, it is sorry sorry Hannah to interrupt but um, um even interestingly in women who are in surgical menopause and I'm, I'm sure Hannah has seen cases like that as well we know that 
you know, you have your ovaries removed, you should not no longer um, have a menstrual cycle. But it's almost like your brain isn't aware. Well, it's not almost. Your brain doesn't know your ovaries are no longer there and stimulate your ovaries as before. So women who no longer have ovaries should no longer have a menstrual cycle, should no longer have PMS or menstrual cycle-related mood problems, still feel cyclical. And um, a lot of the time I have met women who mentioned this to a medical professional who were very much dismissed as if they were crazy, but actually it's a thing, phantom cycling. Wow is a thing so there is, it takes time for our brain to catch up with the fact that mm. it's ovaries are no longer responding to the messages from the brain nothing responds because they're no longer there but the brain nonetheless tries to communicate with ovaries that are no longer there so these women may find no one takes them seriously they, they feel like they're going mad they clearly have no ovaries they clearly have no periods they clearly have no menstrual cycle they have a steady um, you know, a release of estrogen that they hope from the HRT they take, but actually inside the brain still goes rampant. <laughs> yeah. You know, we are not robots. It takes, um, there is, uh, it is not just we, um, the ovaries that do their thing. It's the communication between the ovaries and the brain. Um, the menstrual cycle related brain um, function takes up a lot of capacity in our brain uh you know so the transition to not having not being taking up so much um time and effort to control the menstrual cycle takes time for the brain to unlearn to do this as well that's why we need to take all the symptoms that women tell us seriously and not dismiss them and if a woman i hope any doctor who listens and has never heard this if you have a woman in such moment person who says you know what i know it's not a thing i know it sounds crazy but i feel like i'm cycling just take us seriously, you know, um, yes, and that's yes. important for us as well. That's why we have written that in the book too, to make a point that they're not mad. Yeah, yeah and there, there is, a, oh, sorry, I had to mean no, to interrupt no, you. No, no, I was just going to say it's so important. I hadn't even thought about the function of the brain. No, and the brain's still firing off the messages. Yeah. The messages are still, are still there, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Hannah, what were you going to say? The only thing is, although um, Mandy's obviously completely right with the whole the phantom cycling, we definitely need more um, more research because this particularly affects younger women who've had their ovaries removed for PMDD, you know, so, you know severe form mm. of premenstrual disorder. Um, it's and this also also happens with women who've had this for endometriosis as well. But there can be ovarian remnant syndrome in a very very small minority of cases, and that is where there is some ovarian tissue. So although yes, we have we see the random phantom cycling that can happen. Sometimes there can be a bit of ovarian tissue left, and that's another reason it's important this is taken seriously, yeah. particularly if it's a condition like um, like endometriosis. So you, um, that the appropriate investigations can happen. Um, but yeah, I was probably we're probably going too far and down the kind of specialist like complex discussions there. But it's it, it's yeah, we we basically we need to listen to women. Um, yeah. And whether or not there's any ovarian tissue still there, definitely the brain is, is still desperately trying to get its message across. So that yeah. does complicate things. Yeah, I, I think ultimately it does come down to to listening, doesn't it? And women's pain is is quite often over over the, my fifty three years, I've been disbelieved so many times by by female doctors generally mm. um because that's who I've mainly had but um I think hopefully you know with 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 your book and um with podcasts and things hopefully that's you know going to change but um yeah let's let's see so moving on to this is a question this is particularly from me okay um so um it, uh, I've put um we learned so much oh this was a brilliant chapter your non-hormonal treatments um chapter uh, you don't just tell the reader what's available but it's also give a great explanation of how and why they work um you also look at complementary therapies and yoga I'm a yoga teacher hence my interest and we love your notes on animal products in medication and I'm vegan so again I loved it um, plus in chapter six in nutrition you have a quote from Nina um, who has POI who says um, I did a lot of research and read that a whole food plant-based diet is one of the healthiest ways to live so uh, I sort of read that and I, have you got an interest in vegan or plant-based or are either of you plant-based um, um, yeah I'm I'm vegan, um, and obviously Mandy's a nutritionist. Mandy's not vegan, but um... no. But I would say I'm, I I have um, a plant-rich diet. Mm. 
not exclusively vegan, but uh, plant rich um, with, I, I have dairy, I like my coffee, but I know, <laughs> but I do, I do focus on good quality um, um, food, so free range organic if, if, if available. So yeah, but it's, I would, I would say that a plant rich diet is, is already um, a, a bonus. Yeah. If, if you can yeah, yeah. the yeah i mean the 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 reason we wanted to kind of put this in because obviously my i mean i i've been vegan for several years now for ethical environmental reasons and um but i and I, but i've changed the kind of the way i eat in in terms of obviously never i have not i don't have any animal products but it was trying to make sure it was a healthy kind of plant-based diet because although it's brilliant that there's lots of um more vegan alternatives on the market now it's now quite easy to be a junk food vegan <laughs> so we kind of need to differentiate that from kind of a healthy kind of plant focused diet um so and, and I think it's through my own experiments I realized I need to look at the quality of my diet because that really did impact how I experienced my own symptoms but I see it with patients as well and obviously Mandy's um, aware of that because of her further training that she's done and all the research that we've had uh, we've we've seen and we've heard about even presented at the recent British Menopause Society conference that says that a plant rich plant focused diet is is the way to go in terms of symptom management and long term health concerns but the reason we mentioned specifically about animal products in in the hts one i suppose because of my own kind of background i for me it's important but i also some patients come to me because they know i'm vegan and they want they, they know that i'll be able to advise them which medications won't contain animal products but even with practitioners who aren't vegan or vegetarian or anything everybody comes across people with you know different concerns whether it's cultural religious um you know ethical dietary concerns and it's so we just wanted to say that there are options for everybody um i mean obviously if you're vegan then there are some things that contain gel gelatin for example that you would probably choose not to have unless there's no alternative but um we just wanted to let people know that there is things out there because there's other myths out there that all hrt comes from um, horses urine um and that, that, that's not the case especially in the uk in fact i very 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 rarely see that prescribed um i think in the us it's probably different but in the uk certainly um so it's just we it's, it's hard to cover everything but that's why we put that in there um I, I think you've, gosh, I don't know what you haven't covered. Um, it's, 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 <laughs> everything. it's absolutely brilliant. You've covered everything. But yeah, you've managed to cover everything, but yeah, in really easily digestible little sort of snippets in in comments from people and in little fun facts. Yeah, um, like facts. yeah they were brilliant. And yeah, that like you're saying about, um, you know, you've even put in, I think there, what, what the vegan society say about, um, you know, if you can't find your medication, uh, maybe it's got something in that, you know, an animal product in that you wouldn't want to eat. It, it's got what you've what the vegan society would say about that. And I think that's, there's, mm. there's more and more people with different diets. It's really important, isn't it? So, so when we're talking about diet as well, so what would be your top tips for nutrition in menopause? So I think um, we have to be quite clear. I and mean, then both Hannah and me, or, uh, we have the same, we, I think we are in agreement here that there is no actual menopause diet. Um, nothing that is specifically different from the way any anyone who wants to adhere to a, um, a healthy diet should be, should be doing. However, so... You, we need to, to pay attention to our protein. So we have these three macros, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And protein is in particular, is particularly important for our bones and muscles and skin and connective tissues. And it's important that we um, meet our protein threshold. So we should have a, a, a good portion of protein-rich food on our plate with each meal. Um, so um, plants, on the other hand, um, so it can be plant-based or or non-plant-based protein, depending on, on what your, your background diet is. Um, and then plants in general are vegetables, green-leafed um, vegetables, and um, should be eaten in abundance. And hopefully women, or it's, it's achievable to eat a rainbow of, of different colored vegetables as well across the spectrum. Um, because we need fiber, they also um, which, which are important for our digestive system, the microbiome. As Hannah has already said, the estropolome, the bacteria in our gut are, play a much, much larger role than we have previously known with regards to mood um, and, you know, the, the, H, um, the, the gut brain axis, but also with the, um, they interfere with um, the metabolism of hormones 
as well. So we need to make sure that we have enough fiber in our diet and that comes from plants. Um, they also uh, contain very valuable micronutrients like magnesium and calcium minerals that we need for our bones and for our skin. Um, and one of the things which is probably not diet related, but more, uh, more lifestyle related is alcohol, this, which is something that we recommend should be enjoyed in very small amounts when you're menopausal. I think this is the biggest, the biggest sort of rule where we would advise to cut something out. Other than that, we would not necessarily um, ask women to have a restrictive diet or cut anything out. Um, specifically, for example, gluten or something when you don't have a problem with it, you know, so there, there are um, phytoestrogen rich foods, um, so soy or um, pea, pea protein or um, other um, phytoestrogens, they can make a different difference to your symptoms. So if a woman is not able uh, to take HRT with regards to um, contraindications, so she has had a hormone sensitive cancer and she would like to improve her symptoms through her diet, then Yes, it can be beneficial to focus on uh, an increased intake of um, plants that contain phytoestrogens, so in particular soy, but not everyone will find this beneficial, but it's worth trying. It is absolutely safe. So women who have hormone sensitive cancer, sensitive cancers are often worried about eating um, foods that contain phytoestrogens because they're worried about the recurrence of cancer. But that seems to be not the case as long as it is not in a concentrated supplement form where we have very little evidence really. It probably is safe too, but we just don't know because these mm -hmm. trials don't exist. But um, we certainly uh, know that um, phytoestrogens from food sources are perfectly safe um, and they can actually help with bone density. They can help with menopausal symptoms and they can help with overall health, cardiovascular health and um, reduction in colon cancer. Um, and actually they can reduce the risk of, of breast cancer or even recurrence. So um, th this is something we advocate in the book and we're quite confident about that as well. Um, so we're talking about food sources here, not supplements so to be very clear, um, supplements that contain phytogen in, in, in that you can buy over the counter are different. And um, yes, yeah, so you, you may get the benefits for your menopause symptoms and alongside you get major other health benefits because the plant brings all these other micronutrients with it. Um, but yeah, on the whole, there is no specific menopause diet. Um, it, it's, it's really the bottom line of um, fo the focus should be on plants and, and eating a rainbow of different fruits and vegetables. Protein intake should be, should be a, a, one of the, fo the focus as well and not drinking alcohol. But it's, it's, you can... Over th food can be a major source of uh, contention and diet as well. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult subject sometimes, um, which can be very overcomplicated. Um, yeah, I think particularly it must be very difficult for people in their 20s, you mm -hmm. know, to say give up alcohol. I mean, when I think, you know, I mean, I don't drink now. You you don't drink as much, no, now, do you? And, no, I can't. And, and when you get older, you change what you drink any anyway. But I can't drink. No, I gave up alcohol. I couldn't. I couldn't face the next morning um but it's very difficult for uh, somebody in their mm. 20s isn't it to mm. sort of uh give up it's, it's different saying to people in their 50s it's you know because i think sometimes in your 50s you want a change you're looking for a kind of a change in your lifestyle a little bit anyway but in your 20s yeah, with POI ooh, and in your 20s yeah. yeah and i think it can feel unfair i think we've got a quote in the book actually saying that she didn't this woman didn't want to be told you know cut down or reduce alcohol because she already feels that the poi had robbed her of yeah. so much and then she felt she was losing a normal experience as a, a 20 something year old and yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, that's really, really difficult. I think a lot of people will realize that they just don't tolerate alcohol as much, which is happens in natural menopause. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly something that I found. Um, I mean, overall, I thought, well, you know, it's better for my health. And I don't, I can drink small amounts, but I don't drink very often. Um, it's just not worth it. But I think overall, that's good for my long term health. But again, I was older, I wasn't 20. And um, I was never a massive drinker anyway. And <laughs> It, it, it is it is hard so I think it's more about kind of moderation that's why you don't want to be completely dogmatic in a book it's more about what you do most of the time so yeah. there's somebody else I think in the book who says that she just chooses the best quality wine she can have and have one glass of wine with a nice meal occasionally um it, it's it, it is it is dif difficult um and for girls and women in that you know in their teenage years and 20s you don't want it to become a major source of stress whether it's the food or the alcohol in terms of food I often say to people rather than this becoming a big source of stress think about what more what what other plant food can I add into my meal so 
if you're having breakfast, can you chuck in some frozen berries? If you're having lunch, can you add a bit more salad? Can you add another serving of vegetable? If you're making a curry, could you chuck in some lentils? That kind of thing, mm, rather yeah. than thinking I've got to completely change everything all at once when you've been given a pretty devastating diagnosis. It, so yeah. No, yeah. I love that. It's, it's, it's more about adding, it, isn't it? Yeah. 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 yeah, adding something, not yeah. saying, taking you know, it away. taking it all away. Yeah, yeah, yeah brilliant. Definitely. Um, where are we, Lou? So Number yeah, seven. as yeah, as we we've said before that we I love chapter seven, um, and it's it's intermingled with all these sort of um, fun facts. One fact uh, we particularly liked was tears contain cortisol. Who knew? Who knew? So Mandy, Mandy knew. Mandy put it in. Mandy knew. <laughs> well it's brilliant, done, Mandy. Mandy. So, so basically, a good a good old cry really does help our mental well, health and it's a way to get rid of um excess stress hormones so i guess we all know what it feels like the pressure of feeling emotionally unwell and and welling up literally it, it's it's the body's at a, at a level where it cannot cope with this amount of stress and as an outlet i think from an evolutionary standpoint it's either you've got two options the cortisol either makes you so unwell that you are in a uh, in a fro you freeze you know rather than fight and flight you freeze you can't move you you you're stuck or you get rid of you find a way of getting rid of the excess cortisol and adrenaline so um yes i found that a very interesting fact when i was re researching cortisol in general um because you know we also now practice we find that that there is no magic wand we can wave over anyone and with and hrt isn't a magic wand either we love hrt we're really grateful that we live in a world when we can give women this precious treatment but even though we have it it isn't always uh, the magic cure the panacea for all for all our symptoms and problems so um when I, we did research the book we we looked outside hrt um as one option because stress management is important and yes there's nothing wrong with having a good cry because remember all that that cortisol you don't want or oh, let it flow let it out mm. That's why we have the sense of relief after a good cry sometimes. Mm. And that can be also felt after a joyous cry. You know, if you haven't seen a friend for a while and you hug them and you, you cry because you are happy, um, that's probably a, a form of emotional stress. You know, the build up towards meeting them, um, it's, it's emotional stress, but it's a good stress. And then we cry, we feel better. So, um, yes, you shouldn't be crying all the time. Then there's nothing really wrong. No, 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 the but occasional uh, good outburst. Out, yeah. yeah, bring back, bring bring back crying. I think we've got this sort of societal thing overhanging us, women, haven't we? That of being too hysterical. So we've had to kind of keep so much in for so long, and don't be emotional, and don't be in. Don't be yeah, quite most things. You're you're quite often hysterical yeah i don't care no, <laughs> i've gone i'm 54 i've gone past her i don't get what anyone cares about me so so vaginal atrophy if you don't mind me talking about that for a moment and early menopause so why is it important for uh, for treatment for early treatment um for vaginal atrophy in poi well i think just with with um natural menopause i mean the, the symptoms can be pretty debilitating and uncomfortable and it has profound impacts on you know somebody's quality of life um on their relationship sometimes their ability to work um so vaginal atrophy i suppose is, is more of the old-fashioned term for kind of the loss of estrogen affecting the genitourinary symptoms so the vulva the vagina but also the bladder and the symptoms that you know can be multiple so some people may just experience dryness um, and notice the lack of lubrication because estrogen is a naturally lubricating hormone and it's natural as women to have a physiological discharge um you know most most girls and women will be aware of that and that tends to stop or at least greatly lessen with natural menopause and also happens in poi and surgical menopause um and um, the, the, the problem is the estrogen keeps the vagina nice and lubricated um, and um, increases lubrication um, during sexual intimacy and things like that. The sex and everything can become incredibly uncomfortable. Um, and that's one thing. And particularly if you're a younger woman starting out dating, um, starting, you know, a lot of women with POI may never have actually had penetrative sex, for example. 
um, if you're struggling, then that, that can start to form psychological barriers and issues in an area where that wouldn't have occurred if they hadn't had these vaginal symptoms. There's also an increased risk of sexually transmitted diseases if you have um, kind of thinning skin around the vagina and everything, because the, the, the lubrication kind of almost acts as a slight barrier and stuff to bugs and things getting into the bladder, but also um, in, into the vaginal mucosa. So there's so many reasons really why we should be treating treating this and women with systemic HRT so whether it's the patches tablets sprays gels or whatever that will have some impact on the gentle urinary system but it's not always enough so often we do need um, local estrogens so that's pessaries or creams or gels or there's a there's a pessary ring that you can insert into the vagina that contains a low level of estrogen you often need something there which just helps plump up the the tissue makes you more comfortable because you know people can also feel like incredible irritation burning itching mm -hmm. symptoms like that it just makes the skin healthier restores some of the natural lubrication um and just makes it, I, I don't know life easier generally mm -hmm. and earlier treatment is better because this doesn't get better with time um and it can take i mean i think um, you mentioned earlier was it natasha who said that her vaginal symptoms had just got much much worse because she hadn't sought treatment because obviously she was unaware of of you know what she would have needed and things like that it can take a long time to reverse the effects um you know sometimes you, they're only very low dose and that's all you generally need but it can take up to a year sometimes for things to improve if you've left it for many years before getting treatment um so mm -hmm. it's just the sooner the better because you know otherwise risk of things like increasing urinary tract infection cystitis things are much more likely um uh, yeah there's so there's so many good reasons why we should be spotting it yeah. we need to ask about it and i think going back to the first question about the menopause question in you know maybe with cervical screening it's another thing we should be talking about is vaginal symptoms just generally i agree um, yeah the more so. we can just say the word vagina and vulva that the more people are likely to to discuss it and it won't be a stigma my my mum was given local estrogen um for the first time at the age of 88 Wow. I mean, it's just mad, isn't it? And and it did help, but not for, you know, it, it, yeah. it was a little bit beyond that. But that's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> but we need to at least often be continued lifelong, doesn't yeah, it? So. And also, um, 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 moving on, so, um, based on what Hannah said, it's, there are two things. So first of all, it is never too late to start a vaginal um, estrogen. Never. At any age, um, you, you can start it. It is very safe. And the other good point is also that we, we can give it to women who actually have breast cancer or have um, have a history of breast cancer. So um, this is one of the treatments that are have shown to be very safe for most, really almost uh, every woman, regardless of why she has an early menopause. So even if you have had chemotherapy or you had a hormone dependent cancer, we know that these products, the majority of them are very, very safe. They can be life changing um, with regards to the sim symptom improvement and they can be started at any age. And this is a message that still hasn't gone through to some doctors, not all, um, but um, who are always afraid and, and lump the topical vaginal treatments in with a systemic HRT and they're really not the same. So we can use both together and that is often needed to achieve symptom control. And in those who cannot take systemic HRT, we be very much, very often we can actually give them topical treatment uh, while, we, while they can't have systemic treatment. And we really should uh, not be afraid to start it at any age and continue lifelong often as Hannah said. Brilliant. I'm going to leave you with Lou one sec because I just realized I haven't plugged my computer in. So I'm going to go and get my um, charger. Ooh, you all right there I'm for fine. a moment? I'm you being charged. On. Oh my goodness. We don't want it to suddenly go off. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about, so do you have any tips um, for anyone new to their menopause diagnosis, either POI early or peri really? So any, any good tips? I suppose one would be to see your, obviously see your GP, but um, any tips sort of for personally for them to actually take on board? Obviously read your book as well, because it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, I think the first, well, it's not so much it's a tip just for one thing to say is that they realize that you're not alone because I think they can be quite isolating experiences it's yeah. only in recent years that we've been talking more about natural menopause um but early menopause and POI are often still taboo and a lot I mean we've touched on this in the book but a lot of the stuff about fertility being tied up with women's identity and being you know whether or not somebody chooses to pursue becoming a parent or not is, is not really points that you know there's a lot of 
self-identity is tied up with that and um, there's a whole range of issues as to why that might be but it can feel incredibly isolating um, and so I think it is just trying to find your tribe of people so the Daisy Network is a charity for women and girls with POI um, but some it depends why you why you're in um, um, you know POI or early menopause so you know, for example, I, I had my premature menopause because I had endometriosis and um, a significant premenstrual disorder. And it may be that then there are other support groups that you might find more helpful, um, you know, but you have to be slightly careful with some support groups, because, because you know, and <laughs> how they're moderated and things like that. But, you know, places like Endometriosis UK or the International Association of Premenstrual Disorders will be able to kind of offer support there or some of the breast cancer charities have younger breast cancer support and and um, you, you know we've, we've listed them there's so many to go through that we've listed yeah. them in the book um, and I think again it comes down to individual but I think the key thing is you're not alone try and connect even if you don't necessarily want to engage with online thing, people or forums knowing that you're not alone I think is helpful the other thing is try as if you can't if you take some positive from it it's a good chance to kind of future proof your health and a lot of the stuff you have to you're forced to consider at a young age will stand you in good stead so rather than finding something out at 55 60 you know if you're 30 you can you can start doing things like building up strength training to help your bones and your muscle mass um which can also improve symptoms and um, maybe you'll be better at managing your stress because you've been forced to look at that um whereas a lot of women will come across this you know 20 30 years down the line yeah and I think that's a good thing about some of the um groups on like Instagram and stuff because you can like you say you can actually find your tribe and that that's the positive isn't it but like you say if they're unmoderated or badly moderated that's when the misinformation mm. will, will, will come through but yeah I, I think that that's um yeah that was question did question nine yes Jim. lovely yeah I think because <laughs> but basically I would say to anyone who's newly diagnosed to just Go, yeah. buy your book Absolutely. because you know, even just looking at the, the back of the back of the book and saying what it covers. So for, for any of our listeners, it's uh, causes which we've which we've looked at very in a very um, a small amount and in our chat compared to what's in the book. But causes of early menopause and POI, um, when and how to seek a diagnosis, medical and surgical menopause, hormonal and non hormonal treatments, nutrition, lifestyle, self care for Facility, which we haven't touched on, sexual well-being, relationships, self-identity, early menopause, education, and work, and it's, it's there's there's just everything in there from you know it's it's um it's fab it is yeah and like you say some fun Thank facts yeah. fun uh, facts and brilliant and quotes easy, from real people and it's easy easy to, to look and read and follow for, for non-medical people like ourselves it's, uh, it's yeah full of facts. well we said didn't we it's not the sort of book that you have to start at page one and finish at the end you you can just pick this up and nutrition oh i'm gonna i'm gonna look at nutrition you can just pick it up read yeah. some little facts um and it's it's really really really, really well helpful. yeah for yeah. anyone you don't have to be i it's brilliant for for us in natural menopause i've mm -hmm. i've learned more in this book than i've learned in a lot of my reams i'm just looking the, over there i've got a bookcase whole, whole bookcase not as big as yours uh, Hannah, there's a whole book I have empty one at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's got more books than Hannah's in. <laughs> yeah. That's not hard. No. No. Um, can, I also, can I also add with regards to the, the top tips that when you are um, newly um, diagnosed, um, one of the things is that you may have to um, not give up too early on your treatment. So you may have to try different things before mm. you find something that works for you. And this is particularly important when we were quite desperate to get the estrogen into your body. So a doctor will prescribe you one combination. You may not get on with that. But you may need to try different types of HRT, different ways, different routes, and, and until you feel the improvements. And the, the key, uh, or my top point would be don't give up. Uh, don't worry about not you know, being feeling great on the first thing you try, do not give up on treatment, just try a different treatment. It may be frustrating, but it is really worth persevering um, because there will, there may, there, it is important that, that if you can take hormones that you do um, to prevent your long-term long -term health problems. So um, work with your doctor, find a doctor you can work with who are, who does give you hope, who does give you new options, who knows about all the options and who can work alongside you to tweak things if you need to. Um, because um, women I meet, um, they've, they've often been offered one, one or two options and it didn't work and then they stop. And I'm like, oh, I wish you had, I wish 
I had mm -hmm. this is this is so more we could have done, you know. So this is um, also important that that don't expect uh, the first thing to be working for you. Don't even have that expectation. If it does, great. But just keep going, persevere, change things around, tweak it, personalize it. There are so many ways of of mm -hmm. Of, of personalizing HRT nowadays, um, that it's um, that it's not your fault if it doesn't work. You know, it's worth persevering and trying different options. And as yeah. you're not I not think in this, you know, we hear so much of that, don't we? At the the menopause cafes that we run as well, that people oh, I've tried it. No, yeah, no, not, and also not for and, me, and it's not for you. And also, a lot of the time, those same people haven't uh, propped their HRT up with any lifestyle improvements so or, they're trying yeah. to carry on as they've done for the last sort of 40 odd years and it's a time where really we it what is holistic isn't it if we can kind of work um i think it's hannah that said you know hrt isn't always on its own it can't do everything but we need to kind of work all those things in um exercise diet a bit less alcohol, all those things, you know, hugely help. We don't always want to hear that, though, do we? <laughs> I think there's a level of acceptance, unfortunately, that's needed with, um, I don't know, with POI, early menopause, unnatural menopause. And it is, it is quite hard. I mean, I know from a personal point of view, I just wanted, after my surgery, I just wanted to be a normal woman, in inverted commas. And I thought, well, if I just add back my HRT, I don't really need to change anything. I just carry on. And I've realized pain, painfully in some ways, it's been a kind of thing that, that I, I can't, I can't just go on as before. I mean, obviously there was, there were reasons I had to have the surgery because I wasn't well. And so many things improved for me, but equally, I wasn't suddenly just a 35 year old woman the same as anybody else who'd never had that gynae history and I had to accept that I'm now have a chronic condition which is surgical menopause that needs to be managed and it, it definitely the lifestyle factors are key um I used to think it is all about getting the right level of HRT and then I then I realized getting blood tests well my levels are actually okay what else is it oh well is it because I'm not having enough sleep I'm taking on too much work I haven't exercised recently I'm not eating well all of that stuff is so important it is like a big wake up call sometimes, mm. isn't it? If you look at it like that, a big kind of hang on a minute, you know, all these things is everything you're doing actually working for you uh, or, or not. Um, but it does. It takes a, a sort of level of acceptance to move on from that point, doesn't it? Probably took me a few years, to be honest. Yeah, I bet <laughs> at your age, it's yeah. hard enough in your 50s yeah. trying to accept things. But yeah, 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 it's fantastic. So where can people find you? Like websites and Instagrams and things. So we can put obviously the book. Obviously the book. Yeah. So the book, I'll just say the book is the complete guide to POI and early menopause. Um, yeah. Where else? I'm on Instagram um, on hormone equilibrium, <laughs> long name, but um, or you can find me um, under Dr. Mandy Leonhardt, and my website is also hormoneequilibrium.co.uk. But I, um, I have limited capacity for new patients at the moment. Um, that's another reason why we wrote the book because we both, uh, Hannah and and we both found that uh, whilst we do want to help as many women as we can, we haven't got the, the, the time, the capacity to take on everyone who's affected. That's why we wrote the book as well, to um, reach out to as many women as we can, who we cannot personally help, um, <clears throat> to, to find the help they need. Yeah. And uh, I'm not terribly active on Twitter, but I'm on Twitter on Women Equilib, I think, as well. And I'm a little bit active on Instagram, but not terrible. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm um, I'm on Twitter at Dr Hannah Short um, and just Dr yeah for Doctor um, and then my website's just drhannahshort.co.uk um, but Brilliant. yeah I've I've I occasionally go on Instagram but generally my account is deactivated because I just don't have <laughs> I don't You've have been the time busy, though. <laughs> I've never really got the hang of it. Mandy's much better at this kind of thing than me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, a full-time job mm. being on Instagram, isn't it? To keep up with everything. So yeah, and you like you say, self-care, you've got to look after what's you, you've got to prioritize, haven't you? So we'll put all those links and we'll put some uh, link onto the book on yeah, our we'll podcast on. Um, show notes. Um, gosh, I was gonna, I've got here anything we've missed or you'd like to say. Um, I think we've covered everything. I, I think we have, and whatever we haven't is go and is buy the book. Go and go and get the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. Hannah's got to get a, a 
an animal. I don't know if it's a dog. Is it a dog? To the no, left? I've got to go and pick up some sedation medicine for my oh. cat. He's got to go to Yorkshire for iodine treatment. And it's oh. <laughs> long story. But um, oh. yes. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, well, well, we better, yeah, we can't, we can't nice get the cat positive, sorted. Let's get a positive outcome <laughs> for the cat. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both so and much. Tana, for you, need up your to leave, um, you need to leave one shell uh, clear at the, at the background for your cat. I've heard that cats love lying on shelves. Yes, yes they do. <laughs> Particularly if it's warm. Yeah, nice but warm don't put shelf. anything on the shelf because it's like anything like my cat it just knocks everything off. Oh, yeah, exactly. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've already had a cat on the desk this morning, but I shut them out for the moment. So. Well, if there's any, any books that aren't as good as yours, I could knock those off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Push them away. Push them away. Thank you both so much Thank for giving you. us your time this morning. It's been yeah. really, I've loved it. Thank you. Yes. And enjoy the rest no, of uh, no, menopause no. months. So thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. For, for having us. Thank no you. worries. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.